Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Dirty Duck Coffee. I'm Jeff Stanfield. Actually, this is brought to you by Pacific Calls because uh, the boys up in uh, Spokompton, as they like to call it, set this one up. We got Mr. Jay Buner on the line with us today. And you are our first uh, guest that, that was a Seinfeld res- reference. How's that? Uh, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool, man. It made me a household name more than my plan, I think. <laughs> no doubt. Because as you all know, that that is... That show had a cult following. It was probably one of the best shows ever. I think any guy or gal that's uh, driving down the street or doing something, I always phrase it to a to a line from Seinfeld. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty awesome. My phone te- definitely blew up after I was on that. And every time it's rerun and played again, I always get uh, shout out. So it's, it's a pretty awesome deal. Did you know that it was coming, or was it just one of those things that aired and then you're a Seinfeld reference? Had no clue. Had no clue because they don't really refer or, or basically talk about ball players a whole mm-hmm. lot. You know, I think uh, Keith Hernandez and maybe a few others uh, through the years were on there, but not too many. So, um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. I tried to make a cameo because every time we go into New York, um, I tried to reach out to him, see if I can make a guest appearance, but uh, it never worked out. But still, just to be, you know talked about on Seinfeld's pretty awesome. What, it, it, and what's amazing about Seinfeld was it's a show about absolutely nothing. Yeah. It's just four people's <laughs> that's lives. That's what makes it so damn that, That's funny. right. That's what's great. <laughs> and, and they really never touched on anything to uh, – they kind of kept themselves neutral politically and everything else, but it was a huge hit. And that's one of the few – Seinfeld things I remember is how the fuck do you trade Jay Buner? How the hell? It's on. It's on Fox. It's on CBS. Okay, I can't how say the, that. How the hell did you trade Jay, Jay Buner? He hit thirty home runs and a <laughs> RBIs, hundred RBIs. Yeah. Meanwhile, his son's dead, and that's all they care about. <laughs> yes. Which is which is kind of that <laughs> makes it even funnier. So great, great show. Um, we did a, uh, about like I think it went. 20 years later, they got everybody back together and kind of talked about all that and had everybody on it, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So I got. I want to ask you a few baseball questions before we get into everything. You, you right. played with Junior and his dad at the same time. Were they both? Was King Griffey Senior playing when you were there also? I had the lineup card hanging up, frame hanging up. Absolutely, yeah, it was uh, pretty awesome. Pretty darn awesome to be uh, have a front row seat to that, and especially to be you know to watch them go back you know back to back home runs in the same game. That'll never happen. Again, no, father no. son. No. So uh, and pops, you know, I played a little bit with pops with the Yankees too, breaking in and spring training and stuff. So yeah, it uh, and just to, just to the fun that they had, the happy go lucky jabbing that pop would always do to, to junior and making him earn his stripes uh that whole year was pretty awesome pretty fun year but king griffey jr was a hell of a talent oh my god what a swing oh my god yeah arguably the best player i i mean i had a front row seat every night for a long time uh playing to his left playing right field and uh, and he was a human highlight reel. I mean, it was the easiest job in the world for me as a, as a right fielder because i just look at him and go hey bro you got everything <laughs> So take it all, and he would. He'd go basically foul line to foul line. When he was young, he could fly, he could do it all. Uh, great arm, could hit. He did everything. Stole a money bag for you when you needed a money bag. Uh, threw, threw a cutoff man, hit a cutoff man, gave up his body. Uh, I think over the years, all those years of playing on turf later in his career is definitely what took a toll on him, and that's why he started to get beat up towards the end like all of us did. Is he, is, is he going to be in the Hall of Fame? He is in, he the, is Hall in the Hall of Fame. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, he's in the Hall of Fame, and uh, the, uh, another player, uh, Edgar Martinez, just recently went in the Hall of Fame. So, a uh, couple Mariner guys, and Ichiro probably will be in there here, not too distant future. Hope and Lou, Lou missed out uh, by five votes, so Hope and Lou Pinello will get in there. Um, 
And then uh, we'll see. What a, it's, know, it's what a, fun going to Cooperstown. I've been there twice for Junior and, and Gar, Edgar, and uh, it's quite the place. I mean, it's it's not easy to get to, but that town just – the whole town shuts down for – the inductees and it is one of the most fun times you'll ever have you ever get a chance to do it put it on your list of things to do because it's pretty badass uh they roll out the red carpet um it's really really cool deal and then you know there's who's who walking down the street and doing autographs and so it's it's a weekend full of just uh great players do you think uh was lou Pinella as big a hothead as it seemed like for being just a fan uh, he was the best. He was the best. People people came to the ballpark to watch Lou Pinella. And unfortunately, that's what's missing with the Mariners nowadays is Lou Pinella, when he was our manager, could get guys, free agents, to come there because they wanted to play for Lou Pinella. I mean, let's face it. Who wants to go to Seattle and play? It's a long way to go. Logistically, the travel, we travel more by the All-Star break than most teams did all year long. So it took it takes its toll on you. But when you got a guy like Lou Pinella uh, and King Griffey Jr. and uh, Alex Rodriguez and Edgar Martinez and Randy Johnson, and it was a who's who's list of guys. Um, but with Lou there, man, we had guys knocking on the door wanting to come play there. So it was pretty awesome. What a fucking lineup that was. Well, they would, they would. And <laughs> I mean, had, yeah, we could, we, could, we, could, we could swing it. The problem was. We ran out of friggin' outs, man, because <laughs> our pitching staff, we had too many meetings. We wore out a path between right field to center field. I did and left field or the center field because of all the meetings that the outfielders had with junior and center field. I mean, pitch and change after pitch and change. It just took a toll on us. But, you know, yeah, we could we could throw up some runs, but we are losing a lot of eight run ball games and, and that shouldn't be happening. So, but yeah, we could thump it. We like, we like to hit the line. The chicks dig the long ball and, <laughs> and we definitely hit the long ball. That's for sure. Back in the day when y'all would play the Rangers, the score might be 14 to 12. Oh yeah. We love that good old come home. Good old Texas cooking, baby. <laughs> Go to black eyed pea. All my family come in. I loved hitting there. It's squishy all day. I mean, you walk outside, you already got a flop sweat working. <laughs> uh, and it's like, it doesn't take much to get loose. And uh, the ball carries. It, it's a good hitter's ballpark. That old ballpark, the last two ballparks are pretty awesome. And now they got a new state-of-the-art ballpark that I'm excited. I'm really excited to go see. I'm going to go watch them play this year. It's nice that the fans finally get a chance to get back in the stands. And that's another nice thing about being in Texas. Yeah. God bless. 100%. I just was reading about it today, and the Cowboys come out and say yep. they're playing 100 percent too. They don't care really? what the NFL rules are; they're going to put 100 percent. Really, yep. Jerry Jones said today. Yeah, that's now that's uh, only in Texas. Now you you, pl- only in Texas. you played with the ugliest man to ever pitch in baseball too, Mr. Randy Johnson. <laughs> I played with a couple of ugly guys, but big year it was a million. Yes, a face only a mother love. Oh, I'm telling you. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I tell you what. I tell you what, man, if crap hit the fan and we got into a beanball war, because Lou, going back to Lou again, Lou didn't play it. Lou was like, you hit one of our guys, we're hitting two of your guys. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's going to be. And then if it got out of hand, all it took was Randy to stand up on the top step and go, hey, <laughs> I'm pitching tomorrow. And it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and that put a squash to things real quick. The whole beanball thing was over because Randy, he, he'd drill his mother. He even said that. <laughs> I, hit my, I hit my mom right in the neck. I don't care. I mean, it's about winning. And he and he had that. He was that kind of guy, man. He was a son of a bitch when it came the, the night before pitching. And the day he pitched, he walked in. He picked out the tunes. You didn't mess with it. You didn't turn it down. You didn't turn it up. You didn't change the channel. You left him alone. You let him go do his deal. And he was going to give you seven plus, strike out ten plus. And I'm telling you, he was a mean sucker on the mound. Uh, nobody liked him. One, I, I mean, if I had to pick one guy, that'd be my guy in a go-to game that you had and the game was on the line, you had to win, just like what happened in 95. Um, he was in his prime. He was a he was a stud. And then we traded him because we thought his back was hurt. He wasn't going to be able. He goes on and wins mm-hmm. two Cy Young, two more Cy Youngs, a couple World Series in Arizona. I mean, so – the guy took care of himself, um, and he, he was a hell of a pitcher. He was a machine. I got to watch him and Nolan Ryan pitch against each other once. I tell you, both of them were in the same same mold because Randy went to Nolan and talked to him during the winter 
like every every winter they would get together and he would basically sit down and go through the mental part of the game mechanics and uh just i mean that's where randy learned a lot of it i mean i hated facing either one of those guys when randy we in, he ended up getting traded to arizona and he had to face him he's six foot eleven you know, he's assholes and elbows. By the time he lets go of the ball, he's 45 foot. It's right on top of you. He throws 98, legit 98, because it's a different gun and, and the way they measure the, the speed and velocity back then. I mean, it's on you so fast. The same thing with Nolan. I mean, I'll tell you a quick story about Nolan. <laughs> Nolan, Nolan, a great man. No, You know, he knows I'm from Texas, so we'd always talk, always, you know, made a point. You know, yes, sir, Mr. Ryan, sir, because he is the man. <laughs> Um, and he came up and I'm leading off the inning and he's walking up and he's stepping on the edge of the dirt in the grass right out in front of home plate. He's got his head down he's stepping, stepping. And he looks up at me and he goes, you fucking bunt and I'll drill you right in the head. This time up. <laughs> and I go, why the hell would I bunt? I'm not bunt. I'm going to try to take you deep. And he goes, next pitch, he goes to the mound freaking over my head. So that's the kind of that's the kind of guy Nolan Ryan was. He he was just like Randy. He wasn't afraid to give you a, what what he called a bow tie, uh, and they would definitely keep you honest and not let you have a comfortable at bat. So the bow tie, uh, I'm assuming it's neck high, just right at your right there. Yeah, wear that bow tie, baby. Oof. Now he just as long as you're not spitting chicklets, that's fine. I don't want to be I don't want to be spitting chicklets. I don't want to get hit in the mouth and lose my shine. He um, when he would throw when his curveball was on, he was hard. To, he was almost unhittable. No one. Yes. Oh, he was. I mean, he had. I mean, he's threw again. He threw a hundred. Uh, he was mean. Um, yeah, his curveball was a twelve to six curveball. Like you roll it off the end of the table and it drops straight down. The spin velocity. I mean, he had another gear on his fastball where where it literally you would all of a sudden you were like, oh damn, I better go to a two strike approach and spread out because his ball would get on you. Um, he hid the ball so well with that high knee. And then next thing you know, it came out and it was hard to pick up where his release point was. And that ball would get on you in a hurry. So you couldn't afford to try to gear up, even though you knew you're going to get a fastball and you have to cheat. You can't cheat too much because it's by you. So he's one of those few guys that even though you knew a fastball was coming, it was hard to hit. See, and I always want, cause Nolan Ryan was before my time. And, and I always wondered what kind of made Cause he's, he's not a big guy, is he? Ask Robin Ventura what kind of made oh, him. Oh, I know. Busted, but I always wonder, <laughs> like, what made him. That's a famous picture in, in Ranger Stadium when you go in there. It's his bloody jersey <laughs> where he just beat the piss out of Robin Ventura. He picked on the wrong old man that night. Absolutely. <laughs> Nolan's just, a, he was just an old timer that didn't put up a shit. He's, what, Nolan was probably 6'2", 220 maybe? Yeah, and he's a Texas boy, yeah. you know. He grew up on a ranch. He grew up throwing hay bales around. I mean, he was strong as an ox, and he didn't play it, you know. He didn't care if you did like it. He was the president of his fan club and didn't care if you were a part of that or not. He, he, didn't, he didn't care about making new friends, so especially when it got between the lines. So that's what I respected and admired the most out of him is the fact that, you know, the way he took care of himself and his longevity. Um, and unfortunately, we were the last team he pitched against. He blew his elbow out and never came back after that. So um, that was kind of a sad time, too. What what, what was it like knowing 19-year-old Alex Rodriguez? Um, we had to keep him, uh, keep him kind of in line. He wanted to kind of make his own rules and wanted to be – he was a young buck and uh, didn't want to show up early a lot of times and would cut it like down to five minutes before stretching. And so, yeah, he was in kangaroo court a lot, <laughs> but uh, we had a veteran, we had a veteran club uh, that really basically, I think that was the best thing in the world for him is being up in Seattle. It's a small market. The media wasn't real big. It wasn't in the camera's eye a whole lot. Um, and there wasn't a lot of expectation on him yet. And, you know, it was a murderer's row and we had, you know, pretty darn good staff and, and team. And he was able just to kind of come in and, cruise through and make a name for himself. So I think if you'd ask him, even when he talks about it still to this day is, is probably one of the best places he could have broke in because a collective group of us kind of kept him in line and made sure that he didn't uh, try to create a monster because he wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. With us. Well, he was a hell of an athlete. A lot of people don't realize he had a full ride to the university of Miami. I believe he's a quarterback. Out of yeah. High school. He's, a, he's a huge Miami fan. He shows up. He's always at games, whether it's football, basketball, baseball. I know he, 
wrote a pretty nice, sizable check to the program as well. Um, yeah, and uh, he was a hell of an athlete. Man, he got paid. He got two $250 million contracts. I'd say he's, yeah, he, he's got to be pretty damn good to get that kind of contract. And he's married to J-Lo. So, I don't, uh, oh, and, and married to j The rich get richer. Oh, yeah. Well, I saw a picture of her the other day in a bikini <laughs> yeah. at 50-something years old. Your mom needs to start doing some workouts, I'm telling you. <laughs> That's just genetics. Like, it, it, you know, it's just it's kind of yeah, like having no a fastball. Doubt. No doubt. Yeah, she's she got the body of a 23-year-old. Wow. But, you know, I mean, she's a performer, too, yeah. just like Alex yes. is. I mean, you know, they both work out like animals still, and they have to, and it's just one of those deals when that's part of – you know, your makeup, I mean, that's just an everyday deal. That's you wake up every day, you're getting your workout in. It's just, it's just what you do. Same thing with being an athlete. There is a routine that you gotta, you gotta maintain. You gotta stay in shape. You gotta mentally and physically got to eat right. And all those things. He always did that. He was always into that. He was always in the waiting room throwing weights around. And I mean, we're all vain in our own way. So, but, but if he'd have gone to like, if he'd have gone to New York straight out of the gate, it, we might be talking about a different Alex Rodriguez. I think New York personally would have eaten him up right. at an early age. Right. Yeah, I don't think. I don't think. I think there's certain kids' makeups early on. Knowing Alex since he was, you know, broke in with us, I really don't think that. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but we'll never know. But I just don't think he had the temperament and the personality to basically, because back then New York they were ruthless, man. That media, you know, Boston and New York, the media and Philly. It, they don't give a crap. I mean, they boo the crap out of you, even if you're their, you're an all-star and, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, you have a bad AB and they're booing you. And they sing songs about <laughs> you, which aren't really nice. They talk about your family members. They throw they throw coins at you. I think one day I picked up almost $10 during the playoffs. <laughs> Between Junior and I, we picked up $10 worth of quarters. They kept throwing them at us. We are picking them up. We come running in. Both our pockets were full. We're coming in, <laughs> and they're like, they're going, you make a million bucks, leave it alone. We're like, hey, keep throwing it. We'll pick it up, man. I mean, so it's just how it was. But they threw batteries at you. They threw golf balls at you. They threw two-liter bottles of pop. During the playoffs in 95, when we kicked their ass, which they didn't like a whole lot, they were throwing in between innings. You didn't see it because of the TV break during the playoffs. They were throwing from the upper deck two liter bottles of pop that were hitting and exploding. The, the field was littered Jesus. and stuff that they had to open up the left field, left center field wall and right center field wall, come running in with these big 50 gallon plastic trash cans and pick up all this crap. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're doing the countdown and all of a sudden we're back live and nobody sitting at home had any clue what the heck just happened. It looked like a dump site. Out there. <laughs> Amazing. I, I mean, Back then, you never knew. I mean, you were always looking over your back. People were jumping on the field at the end of the game. The cops were just beating the piss out of these guys all the way up the hallway and in the dugout. It was awesome. But, man, I, you, you never knew what you were going to see or get in New York. It was just a craziness. New York's a different animal but, now. Yeah, you don't get away with that now. But back then, yeah. they didn't care. Yeah. I mean, it just it was like anything went. I mean, you you – a car's broke down going to the ballpark. When you came back on the team bus after the game, that same car was on cinder blocks, had no <laughs> tires, wheels, doors, had nothing. It was completely stripped in the matter of six hours after the game was over. And you just scratch your head. And somebody be in there grabbing something. Cops didn't care. They just they didn't want to mess with it. So, Different story now. Giuliani got in there, and he cleaned things up, and – and it, uh, it's a great city. It's a great city. I, I love New York, but I, we always said it was always – the first day in was always the best, and the day we left, man. So Chuck, Especially when we kicked their ass. That was always fun. So Chuck Knobloch wasn't real far off when he was talking on the, about the people on the bus. Chuck Knobloch! Yeah, Chucky. No, he uh, – no, he – yeah, he, he experienced that. He did his – as we called – I broke in with the Yankees. We called – we did our term. So um, – <laughs> Yeah, Chucky, uh, he kind of got the thing over in New York for a little bit there, too. But he was a good player for him. But it's a different animal. I mean, he goes from Minnesota and goes to New York. You talk about a dichotomy in atmospheres. What did he say about him? Uh, he, he, he made a comment on a, the L train or the subway about riding with a single <laughs> mom and all kind of about some gay people and shit. He, oh, made yeah. all, he, he said the same shit everybody else thought about, but he was the first council culture victim. Probably he caught a lot of shit over it. <laughs> yeah. He was the first him and, one. Yeah, him, he, and, uh, him and John he, Rocker. As we were talking earlier. He didn't, he didn't think before he spoke. No, 
No, not at all. Not smart. Not smart in New York. But John Rocker made everybody forget about Chuck Knobloch, so then that went on to another round. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, John John Rocker was off as Rocker. He's a piece of work. He seems uh, like a piece of work. Uh, Pete Rose, you think? He's a hunting machine. He loves to hunt, too, as a matter of fact. Is he, is he down in Texas now, too? Uh, no, he's not down in Texas, but myself, Norm Charlton, a bunch of us, for a lot of years, had a little cast and blast we'd always put together. And Jimmy Houston would come down with, with his videographer, Pat, and they would uh, record it and do like a, do a couple of shows out of it. And, you know, he'd bring Norm, invite a whole bunch of ex-players and, and uh, current players down, and guys would come in during the winter. And it was fun. He made, he made a couple of appearances a couple of years, and then um, – the real rocker came out, so I don't know if he didn't get invited anymore or it was he just didn't show up. But he's a trip, man. We do uh, <laughs> Pete Rose. You, he's out there. Should, should Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? One hundred percent. I think so too. Will he get in? One hundred percent. No, he'll one hundred percent. What he did on the field. I mean, the guy was. I mean, people paid money to go watch Pete play, man, Mister Hustle. I mean, he got dirty, played the game right. The old school player, they brawled, they lived hard on the field and off the field. Um, just, I, I love to watch Pete Rose, and I, I wish he would get in there. I don't, I don't know why they keep holding him back, and, you know, I get it, he bet, but, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, his career numbers speak for themselves. Knock it off, uncle. He was betting on I think he's. I think he is. I think he's done his time, and it's time to forgive. I mean, let's go. And he was he bet on himself too to win. Who don't bet on themselves to win? <laughs> yeah, that's what it's all about, winning, man. <coughs> you don't play for a tie. You don't play to come in second. So does going to a place like New York City when back when it was just this this romper room, does that fuck with you like like as a player? Does the atmosphere well, get will, into your head? I will tell you, it's it's not a place that you want to go out after a game and have cocktails right. and, you know, stuff like that. Because, you know, everybody knows who you are. Somebody's going to inevitably is badder than you, and they're going to come up and try to start shit. And they just, they're going to do anything they can to try to get your ass thrown in jail or arrested so you don't show up. Especially if you're an everyday guy. They want you to be out of the lineup the next day. They're like, yeah, yeah, Buter <laughs> broke his hand hitting me or what? You something stupid. And, and, and another thing New York would do, the bellmen, we had we had aliases. Everywhere you went, you didn't use your name. Right. So if I checked in, I'm, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to use Jay Buner when I check into a hotel room because any Joe Blow could call up and go, hey, give me Jay Buner and they're going to connect you to me. And they're going to do it every hour on the hour from 12 o'clock at midnight all the way to six in the morning so you never sleep. New York was notorious for it. The bellman would find out what your alias even was <laughs> and give people. They would run down the hallway, knock on your door. I mean, just shit like that. So it got to the point where we had to literally have security people on the floors where we were to keep people from coming up there and messing around and dicking around. We you disconnect your phone just so you know nobody would call you. I mean, that's that's just how they were. New York was they they came up with pretty much anything in the book. Nothing was off the record. Nothing was. They, they, and they were amazing, the crap that they would come up with and do. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, New York was, uh, it was a fun place, great restaurants. Always went and saw a play there. It was kick ass. But uh, it was not one of my places I'm going to go go out and tie one on at night. We just go to the hotel bar and hang out and relax. I was in Fenway last summer, or the, no, the summer before. We went to game at Fenway and stuff. The atmosphere at Fenway Park reminds me of high school football in Texas on a Friday night. And I've never been anywhere else like that during baseball game. Yeah. Yeah, they're insane. That's a what a great ballpark. I mean, I love those old school throwback ballparks. Uh, I love the way that they've added seats to left field grandstand out there. I think it's awesome. Um, crappy clubhouse, just old dumpy clubhouse, always stinks. <laughs> but man, the ball, the ballpark is phenomenal. The playing surface is phenomenal. The atmosphere is incredible. The fans are the best. They rag the crap out of you, and then when you rag them back, if you got a good comeback, they always applaud. I mean, they they appreciate that stuff. The on deck circle is right there by the you know the front row, so you can have this banner between the fans because they're right there. Um, and you got to have fun with it, otherwise, you know, they're going to drive you nuts, man. So you got to play back, you got to appreciate it, you got to tip your hat. It's just part—it's just part of the experience. But um, 
yeah, they know their baseball. And um, I will say Fenway Park, chow, I was, I was called Chowderhead so many times. But another place, I mean, they know the game. Them and the Yankee fans, great fans. But, man, they will throw, again, golf balls, batteries, that mean marbles, ball bearings. They just, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, it, it was always, you never knew what you're going to get when you went to Fenway Park either. That's amazing because like at Rangers Stadium, which I've been to 100 games there at least, you don't see nobody doing shit like that. If you saw, no, if you saw no, some, they're not doing that. They're yelling and screaming at you and, you know, you know, saying, you know, trying to have good comebacks and stuff like that. And But they're too busy drinking beer, man. Well, if, uh, if someone threw a battery, awesome. somebody get their ass whooped. Yeah, yeah, and and I will tell you, um, they did a heck of a job security wise. They wouldn't let crap like that fly. No. Whereas in New York, you know, it was. I mean, they it, half the fans were doing it, so it's like <laughs> God, they, they couldn't keep up with it. You know, as soon as they take one guy out, or someone, I mean, it's just they don't have enough cops to keep up with it all. So and nobody's going to think on somebody. Plus, they were too busy fighting each other in the stand. So. I mean, the cops were just having a blast watching it. So were we. <laughs> we'd, be, we'd turn around. You could hear it going, man. You'd turn around. The guys are just duking it out, man. Next thing you know, it's 10, 12, 15 people in the stands beating the crap out of each other. I'm like, <laughs> man, this is another free entertainment right here during a game. <laughs> is, is the baseball... I, I miss I miss that. I will say those are some of the little things that you miss because you don't find that anywhere else where are you going to go on a eight to five job and be able to find something like that happen i mean especially now with covid nobody goes to work anymore it doesn't seem like but um yeah that, that's that's some of the things that you can't replace you know the the camaraderie but just all the the fan experience and the travel and just there's so many different things that uh leaves a hell of a void once you once you walk away so when you do finally decide to walk away is it is it uh is it hard kind of filling in your day because you're used to so much hustle and bustle and you know getting ready for the next season yeah. is it yeah you're a creature of habit so you know you've been doing it your whole life and you get home at you know, usually I'd, I'd be at the ballpark at one o'clock. We'd early hit every day at two o'clock, uh, play the game at 7.05, uh, game's over by 10.30. I'm icing both ankles, both knees, lower back, both elbows, both shoulders, uh, and then having a few uh, cold ones and shooting the shit with the guys. I'm usually home by midnight and then uh, sleep till about 10 and do it again. And so when you retire, it's like, oh, crap, now what do you do? How do you fill that void? Uh, I was blessed that when I was done, I was done. My body, I mean, when they, when your team doctor comes up and says, hey, dude, I can't pass you on a physical, mm -hmm. you know, I could have gone and played maybe in Oakland, but it's like I'm going to end my career where and when and how I want to, and this seems like the best way, and in it in a Mariner uniform was the best way to do it. And uh, so it wasn't as hard for me. Um but, yeah, a lot of guys, it, it rips your heart and soul out, and they have a hell of a time trying to fill that void. I was blessed that I'm still a part of a, a, a company called Northwest Motorsport, NWMS Rocks, up in uh, Washington, and it's a used car and truck dealership. Started off as one dealership. Now we got 12 dealerships. Uh, we just opened up a new one in Boise, uh, getting ready to open up one in Missoula. Uh, we're kicking ass and taking names. And so to be a part of that and be the spokesper uh, spokesperson for that organization, all the OGs and all the people there, just great. They're like a, a family away from family. It basically was, it's so funny how being in that business so much like the professional business. And so that, that's been a blessing for me. I still do it, fly up there, you know, on occasions, a little tough right now. Mm -hmm. But so I had something to fall back onto. I was blessed. But for a lot of people, man, I, I, if I didn't have that, I don't know what I would have done. I probably would have gone nuts. I'd have drove my wife nuts. That's for damn sure. <laughs> I can imagine. Because I, I was the practical joker. So I was a guy, you know, trying to create up new things, I, pranks I was going to do on guys like cellophane, you know, Reynolds wrap over the toilet on my wife, you know, just stupid <laughs> things, you know, baby powder in the hair dryer, all these different things that you got, you know, coming up with new different stuff back then. Um, now that's old hat. That's not anything to do that anymore. It's like, oh, come up, be something, be original. But Growing up isn't always fun, is it? Hell no, I still haven't grown yeah. up. I'm grandpa. See, I'm grandpa, <laughs> baby. I'm number one grandpa. That's what it's all about. So, 
Yeah, and he and my, my little guy, he just turned one, and he blows a mean duck call. So he's already blowing a witch call, a duck <laughs> call. Um, we're going to get him into it, man. He's going to be a monster. So that, that's, what's, that's what's great about Texas, too, being able to come back to Texas because growing up here, um, I've been blessed. Got a chance to grow up fishing, learned all the fishing holes from Alton Jones. So I've, I've rubbed elbows and fished and hunted with Jimmy Houston. I've done some things with Tom Miranda Outdoors. I've been blessed to, through you know my profession, meet some of these people and get a chance to do some pretty first-class badass hunting and fishing trips. And it's so nice to be back in Texas to have those connections again and get back to duck hunting. God, I hadn't been able to do it. I wasn't doing it in Seattle. So we stacked them this year. It was a blast, man. If it flew, it died. If it flies, it <laughs> dies. And we had, a, we had a blast. Now, you were hunting in Seattle area or around San Antonio? I was no down here and I Seattle I hunted a little bit but it's hard. I mean it, it's just there's not a it's the hunt and fishing up there's tough. It really is. But no, this is back here. Uh, around here going down to the coast, Rockport with Norm Charlton and, and another buddy, Brett Phillips who owns the lodge at Goose Island, first class operation. Um, <clears throat> and then doing a lot of duck hunting with my brother up in Waco, Texas. So they got they got a nice little honey hole up there and had a blast. So it's it is so nice to be back and be able to do those things. Do you, I mean, it's like like you guys. That's what it's all about, right? That's right. Yeah. How many times you get confused for Steve Stone Cold Austin since you're living in the same? <laughs> you live in the same town. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. He's in Birmingham. Yes, he's, that, around, he's around here, and his boy is Goldberg. And so my son's still trying to hang on in the minor leagues, and he works out just up the road here at A one. And he was in there the other day and said, "Hey, Dad." I didn't see Stone Cold, but Goldberg was in here with his with his son. So they're in the area. They're around. I, I got a baseball signed by Stone Cold. Got the chance to meet him, and rub elbows with him, drink a beer with him. He put two fuck face. Stone Cold <laughs> Steve Austin. <laughs> that sounds like something he would write. Uh, he's a he's a piece of work, man. He is a piece of work. But yeah, he's around here quite a bit. Yeah, and then and then another guy. They think I'm that. What uh, what's his? I can't remember that MMA fighter. Um, there's another guy, I guess I, apparently I look like, so I don't know. We, it's kind of nice to be back in Texas. Not a lot of people know who the hell I am, so I can just go about everyday life and blend in and live happily ever after. When, at the height of, let's say in 95 when Seattle, when y'all were on fire, could you go, yeah. could you go anywhere in Seattle without getting, where you couldn't even enjoy yourself? What, you know what, it's a blessing, let's face it. I mean, you know, to be able to, <clears throat> save baseball in the Northwest because that's what we did in 95. We saved the game. I mean, yeah. we lost the vote and then they recounted. We got into the pl- one game playoff, won that, took the, the city by storm. It was like everybody's first love. There's no way in hell they were going to vote down the new stadium. So to be a part of that and that group of guys and every day, it was like that run. Every day there was a new hero. We won games that you'd scratch your head going, did that just happen? We were down six runs going into the last inning. We just won. I mean, Guys, guys coming off the bench, you know, our number five outfielder hitting a pinch hit home run, <laughs> Doug Strange. And, yeah, you know, I mean, just guys every day contributing. That's what was so much fun about that. And so because of that, I still go. I was just up there two weeks ago moving my son out and moving him down to Austin, Texas. And, yeah, I mean, I still walk around and, and, it, and it's cool. I love it because people talk to me like we're buddies, like we're best friends. And that's the rapport I still have with the fans in the city of Seattle. It's an unbelievable place. It was an unbelievable time. And um, so very blessed. But then I come down here, and then it's like, just cruise on. Nobody knows. So it's kind of, I'm blessed. I have, you know, I have Northwest Motorsport being the spokesperson still up in Seattle, cruising around all that area, and then come down here and just kind of be a grandpa. That but. Pretty awesome. That's that old stadium was a real shithole. <laughs> it was. I tell you what, though, it was a beautiful place to hit every day. It was seventy degrees. Wind was blowing out at about you know one mile an hour because they had a tendency sometimes. Well, I'm not going to say like in Minnesota where they turn the fans on every time they were up to help them. <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, the ball flew there, and, and especially in 95, it was packed. And so you heat that place up, and the ball's jumping. Um, for me, I could play what I call a lazy right field. I just back up five steps from the outfield wall, and anything over my head was either off the wall or out of the ballpark. 
not not a real tough outfield to have to play. So, uh, but yeah, it was it was and then the tiles fell. Hell, if we wouldn't have gone on strike in '94, we'd have finished the whole we'd have played the whole year on the road. So yeah, shithole is about right, but still a very <laughs> fond memories. I tell you, a cool thing about that that I can say that I got a chance to do that nobody else has is we got a chance to go up on top of the roof right by the flagpole. We got the secret key, got up there and watched the blue angels come over the top. Oh shit. That dude, I'm telling you, they use the flagpole as their line to go right down over the Puget sound. They come over the top of that flagpole, no more than 50 feet. And they bust that thing. Oh my goodness. That was, you talking about a first class view. Pretty awesome. It was a one-time deal, but uh, yeah, a bunch of us climbed up there. You know, it's 50 feet straight up. You slip and fall. We were all <laughs> toast. But you get up there, and it, it was pretty damn cool. I'm sure that's pretty cool. I'm sure that's exactly what your manager wanted y'all to be doing. Bunch of professional athletes climbing on top of the roof. We sure as hell weren't going to tell anybody we were doing it. We all snuck up there. It's like right after BP, we, went, we were gone. Everybody's like, where the hell did everybody go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Pretty cool deal. So what was the strike in 94 about? Money. Well, no shit. Yeah, it was about money. It was about uh, basic agreement and trying to make a stand. And, and, you know, that's the last time players went on strike. And, and uh, unfortunately, um, you know, something like that could happen in the next year or so when they c- come up, it comes time for a basic agreement. So none of these kids have any clue what it's like to go on strike. And at the time, I lost a million dollars, man, which back then, that's a lot of friggin' money, man. I'd take that back right now. Yeah. But it revamped. It changed the way the game was. Um, and, uh, it was tough. I will say 95, the start of 95, we were a little late getting started and, uh, fans weren't real happy, but we changed Seattle fans. Uh, that changed real quick when we started, we started making that little bit of a run and they forgot about that pretty quick. But so what, what about, hold on. It cost Montreal Expos a world series championship, didn't it? I tell you, you talk about a talented team. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, go back, go back and look at some of those Montreal teams. Um, I mean, Pedro, just a minute, Vlad, uh, Larry Walker. I mean, it was a uh, Marquise Grissom. Uh, I mean, you, it's, it was a who's who of guys. And Tim Raines, t- a lot of Hall of Famers. They were, they were good. What Moises Alou on, good. on there? They were good all through the minor leagues. I played against them all through the Randy Johnson, Brian Holman, who we ended up getting in a trade. You know, playing those guys, them in Atlanta through the minor leagues, it was a buckle up, Chuck. They were good. I mean, it was like, golly, they were like tenfolds better than any team. You're out there, you're like, we got no freaking chance against these guys. It's an all star team. Half of them every at, at every level, most of the team was an all star. So, yeah, I mean, they they had a hell of a run. They were they were a very talented team. But again, logistically, it killed them being up in Montreal. I mean, what a god, what a bitch for travel. I mean, same thing with Toronto, especially now. They can't even – I don't even know what's going to happen. I don't even know if they're going to be able yeah. – Canada still – the border of Canada is still closed. I think Trevor was telling me we talked – I don't think I don't think you can go to Canada and do any goose hunts no. or any no, of that stuff. No, you can't. Um, no, so I, last I heard, it was shut down. The border shut down. I don't know how they're going to play games. They're going to have to do that um, – I think they moved – what, they played in Buffalo last year. So I guess they're going to end up doing that again. kind of sucks so you don't get a chance to play in front of your hometown fans. I- I tell you, a guy from back in the day that I was always a big fan of. It seemed like a really good guy was Kirby Puckett. Mm. First class, all the way. One of the greatest people you, you, you'll ever meet. His famous saying is, you, "You'd always come up and go, hey Kirby, how's it going?'" He goes, "Hey, hey, 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 bone, hey, bone, just hanging like a sack of nuts." <laughs> <laughs> every time, every time. I mean, oh, that's great. First class. I, I absolutely. There are guys that. You know, left an impact on my career. Kirby Puckett, without a doubt, was a great mentor. Every time you go in, sit around after a game, go have a beer with him, shoot the cud, just talk baseball. Always gave the time. Superstar, superstar person. Um, Tony Gwynn, superstar, superstar person. Um, Unbelievable person. Unbelievable person. And what an ambassador for that city. First class guy and ambassador for the game of baseball. I got a friend of mine who was a Minneapolis. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Yeah, because he's a good. He was a good man. It's a Minneapolis police officer, and he named his son after him. And but he worked the games all the time, so he got to be friends with him. And he used to always tell me about how nice a guy he was. 
Yeah, and that's what a lot of a lot of police officers would do is when they're done doing their shift, they come in, make some extra money being on the field, you know, either in the dugout. It, we always had two in the dugout, one on each end. There was two in the bullpen, just always moving, keeping an eye out in case people were starting to get crazy or throw something. Um, they always came out in between innings. There'd be three or four of them in each side. So, yeah, it was always nice to know that those guys had your back and were always there, especially, especially around the family section. They gave you the peace of mind knowing because there, there's a lot of there's a lot of idiots out there yeah. and they know where the family section is and who you are, especially on the road. And they always had they always had your back, your family's back for as a player. I don't give a shit about what happens to me. I could care less. I can take care of myself, hopefully, uh, barring anything crazy unforeseen. But knowing that your family's safe, that's you ask any player. It's just like, I don't care. Just make sure my family's safe. And so a lot of times. I never allowed the one place I never let my family go was to New York because I knew how crazy it was. And I just didn't want to take that chance. That was the only place they couldn't go. Okay. Another question. Who is the easiest pitcher to steal bases off of for you? <laughs> are you being, are you being a smart ass? You know, you got, you got a record, a major league record. Career steals. <laughs> and they're all on the back end of a freaking double steal or a hit and run that went wrong or something like that. I couldn't steal a base if I had to. It, it's, uh, I think I, I got the worst percentage, I think, in the you game. You do. That's why, mistaken. that's why I asked. But you know what? Who gives a shit? I got paid to try. <laughs> I got paid to drive in runs. And I tell you what. That is, I will toot my horn. That was one thing I was really good at doing. Yeah. I was a different animal when men were in scoring position. I got the job done, and I could, I could, I could score from second base. I made damn sure that I got good secondary leads. But I wasn't Mister Fleet on my feet. Uh, but that's okay. I didn't get paid to do that, you know. And it's, and that's part of as a player, you got to accept who you are, man. You know, it's just one of those things. Is it embarrassing? Yeah, I guess to an extent. But you know what? You hit a game-winning home run at the end of the day. Nobody's going to talk about how you didn't steal a bag or get, or you got thrown out by 10 feet. Who cares? There's more guys in the Hall of Fame for hitting home runs than there are from stealing bases. Damn right. Do you see that damn steal right. sign and you're like, God damn it. Here we go again. <laughs> I got a fucking bust ass down no, there. No, because Lou, Lou was like, I, uh, no. It just give me a good secondary lead sign. Just give me a good secondary lead ball in the dirt. Just get your ass to second base. All right? Don't be trying to steal. <laughs> Don't be trying the bunt. Just get up there, assholes and elbows, hit the ball out of the ballpark, drive in and run for me, get yourself a score from second base. That's all I care. Did, did, that was Lou. End of the day. You're, go get him. Now, did you – Pretty pretty simple. Did you play under Don Zimmer ever? Or was you around Don? No, I did not. I did not. Great man. Great baseball man. Uh, played against uh, – he was a coach on the with the Yankees on that staff for a long time. Um I mean, he's a lifer. He was a lifer. He was um, just a another funny, crazy, uh, happy-go-lucky, I mean, great ambassador for the game. Now, you hit the first cycle as a Mariner, for, for I, the Mariners. Yeah. How, what's your mentality like that? Because, I mean, you, get, you, you hit the Grand Slam first, I think is what I saw. you got to be getting towards the end and be like, motherfucker i gotta do it here what would you need at the end well it, yeah it was my last ab luckily we went into extra innings so it you know but it still counts but um i hit a ball high the right center and i was and i'll be honest with you i was going get out mm -hmm. i knew that i was a triple short of the cycle but I, let's face it i wanted another home run right. i'm like get out get out he hits off the wall and the, the right fielder and the center fielder have a yard sale <laughs> And next thing I know, I basically get into third base. So that's what it took in order for me to get it. But you know what? You got to hit it in the right spot. I guess I did. That's right. And triple is probably the hardest one to get out of all, out of it everything. Is, it is. It is for, for most people. It really is. And uh, the great thing was, is after I did it, I'm laying on the ground, huffing and puffing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, somebody grabs me under their arm, picks me up. It's Junior. He goes and reaches down and grabs third base. <laughs> The umpire is like, what are you doing? And he takes off running, goes into the dugout underneath because there's a hole that goes underneath into our clubhouse. And it's underneath the stands, runs into the into the clubhouse with third base. And then they're like, well, now what the hell are we going to do? So now we're sitting there for like five minutes, delay a game while they call the grounds crew. They got to go try and find another base. And they brought 
open up the outfield wall, come running out, stick another third base in, and then we continued on. So I still have the base to this day. That's badass. Can you think about yeah. can you think about hitting the cycle and do it, or do you just have to kind of clear your mind and let whatever happen happen? Well, I knew I knew that I was a triple short, so I was I was you think about it, but realistically, as many times as I had a chance to do it, the chances of I mean it's harder it's harder to hit a cycle than it is to throw a no hitter right. or a perfect game. Yeah. So, um, there's been fewer of those than anything. So it's, um, but yeah, I knew when I rounded second base, I was like, I'm not stopping for nothing. I don't care if I get thrown out by a mile, but like I said, luckily they both fell down and I basically, I still had to dive into third base. (laughs) Did did you get frustrated when you'd have a teammate that couldn't get his shit straight when it come to drugs and stuff and couldn't stay on the field? Did that, does that get on y'all's nerves as teammates? You know, we really didn't have guys like that, to be quite honest with you. We, we had enough, you know, leaders uh, on the team that basically nipped that in the ass real quick, really and truly. If it got in the way of you competing, which means it's it's costing us as a team games, you're letting us down, you're done. Done. So guys didn't do it's that. Always- I'm not saying there weren't a few times when somebody did something stupid or – you know, but for the most part, no, we didn't have anybody failing drug tests. We didn't have anybody, you know, getting arrested. Uh, we did have one guy that stuck his hand through a window when he was drunk one night and cut his hand open and that put him on the DL. That was pretty stupid. But that that's about the extent of anything that was ever bad. We didn't we, we really didn't have anything like that. Didn't have to worry about that. We had the right. Because I'll, I'll again, it comes back to Lou, man. Lou's the fearless leader, and nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to fuck with Lou, man. I mean, the wrath of Lou was was hard enough, and then having your veteran teammates that are going to come down hard on you too it was pretty good. It was pretty cool. That, that's why we were, that's why we won because uh, because we police things, and Lou was confident enough to let us basically he didn't micromanage. He let the veteran guys in the clubhouse do those things. And then he worried about basically coaching the game. Yeah, that that I, I can't imagine. Just having that veteran locker room cuts out all the riffraff. It's huge. I mean, you it's see huge. some. Of, you know, you, you hear of all these these teams and like, well, you know, we got a young team. That in a professional setting, that's got to be like the last thing that you want is to have this this young lineup that's just going to run run amok anytime they leave the the state. Well, and, and, you know, unfortunately, you look at some of the young guys that, you know, during the playoffs that basically decided they wanted to go out and have fun with their buddies. And then you got the COVID deal. They were getting basically suspended. And, I mean, it's happening right now. Guys kind of forget what they're doing sometimes, you know, and get smacked on the hand a few times. But, you know, just as long as um, you live and learn they're not repeat offenders, then, then it's not bad. It's not bad. We're all going to fuck up from time to time. Let's face it. I mean, we all do stupid stuff, um, and you just hope that uh, nobody gets hurt. It's all fun and games till somebody gets hurt. So, when did you know that you had a legitimate shot at playing pro ball? How old were you? Um, I'll be honest with you. In high school, I played at a five A in Houston, um, and I didn't know that there was life after high school baseball. Really? And so, yeah, I had no clue until a Philly scout came up to me and said, hey, man, we're thinking about maybe drafting you. And that's when I started to learn that whole process. It was never even a mindset. I, I, I figured I was just going to go to college and be a game warden or something like that. That was what I you know, wanted to do. And, and then all of a sudden, um, I went to a couple tryout camps and ended up getting a scholarship to a junior college in Waco, Texas, McLennan Community College. <clears throat> ended up winning the Juco World Series my first year in 83. And then all of a sudden you go there and compete against the best of the best in the world and win the national championship. I got drafted uh, by Atlanta and decided not to sign with Atlanta because uh, they wanted to make me a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, nope, uh, and went back and ended up getting drafted by Pittsburgh. So I guess it was kind of like, when I uh, when Rudy came up to me and started talking to me, it started to sink in towards you know the summer of '84, uh, basically my senior That's year. That's crazy to think that at 18 years old, in a year or two from now, you're going to be this you know this baseball star. That that's that's hard. Yeah. Uh, that's hard I, to imagine. Thinking about my my mindset yeah. at 18 years old. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I I knew I could play a little bit, but um, uh, and I was always cocky and always the president of my fan club. But I tell you what, I, I went to a military academy for a junior college. I mean, dude, it was it was a hellhole. It really was. <laughs> I mean, the mind games they played, you know, waking us up at 5 a.m. and running six miles in the dark. I mean, just stupid stuff. But uh, it made me a man, it made me grow up, it made me realize, you know, uh, mentally how, how tough I could be. And I think at the end of the day, once I made it through that two years of that, um, I knew once I got into the minor leagues, nobody mentally, nobody could play head games with me. It just set me up for the sky was the limit. And then it was just a matter of right place, right time, and having to put up the numbers. Um, and just got, I was blessed. I got lucky. Why did they, did you pitch in high school? Why'd they want to make you a pitcher? I always had a great arm. And Atlanta, it was right during that time where they had Glavin and Smoltz and, all, you know, they were all about drafting big dudes that had good arms. And they had me in the outfield throwing the first day. And they brought me back the first day as they get you in, they bring you, they, they hit you fly balls, ground balls in the outfield. You come up, throw two to the second, two the, two the third and two to home. And then they, you take BP and you hit and all that stuff. Well, the second day they're like, Hey, we're going to bring in a couple of our cross checkers. We want you to come back. And I'm like, okay. And so I came back and they had me on the mound and they had me throw. And I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't know how to pitch. I've never pitched in my life. Look, throw some curveballs. I'm like, I don't know how to throw. <laughs> just, just spin stuff. Spin stuff. And then um, <laughs> they saw that I had velocity and, and I had some spin. And they're like, okay, we're going to bring all of our top people back tomorrow. We want to make you an offer. We want to we, we want to sign you as a pitcher. So go home, think about it. Come in here, be here about 1030 tomorrow. This is at Atlanta at, at the Major League Stadium. And they flew us in, me and my dad. And so dad and I went home and had some cocktails. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he goes, you want to be a pitcher? I said, hell no, I don't want to be a pitcher. So we didn't go, we didn't go back. <laughs> the next day I was supposed to meet all these people. We went to the airport, jumped on a plane and flew home. Uh, needless to say, that didn't go over real well. Uh, um, and uh, basically I ended up not signing with them and uh, – Ended up going back to school. Now, McLennan was a hotbed. That was a big-time program when you went there, wasn't it? It was. We had a hell of a run. We had a hell of a run. One in 83, lost on a 3-1 run walk-off in the ninth inning in 84. Um, it's great to see them back. They're back as a baseball mecca. Dude, I'm telling you, we, we, when, I, when I was there, our basketball team, the men's and women's basketball team won the whole thing, the tennis team, the golf team. They were a powerhouse. Um, that same year that we won it, Texas was a powerhouse. That year that we won it in JUCO, University of Texas won it in the D1. So um, it was Roger Clemens' yeah, team, uh, wasn't it? What's Roger that? Roger Clemens. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, Roger Clemens, Schiraldi, You know, all those guys. The, yeah, they were a powerhouse. The doctor, Ooh. the doctor in Abilene that operated, Doctor, what's Funk. his name? Doctor Funk. He was the catcher on that team. He's an orthopedic surgeon in Abilene. Oh, really? Yeah. He's done. Uh, he's done two Achilles on Jeff, and he's done my brother's shoulder, and I think an ankle. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. Oh God! Knock on wood, Achilles. I don't want that. I'm gonna tell you oh, what. It's the most miserable oh. freaking thing in fat, the world. I bet. Fat guys don't should not be playing basketball. That's what Jeff learned out of yeah, that. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to feel something hot going down my heel, and all of a sudden have a bundle up behind my knee. It feel. It feels that like that does not sound fun. It feels like someone took a two by four and hit me in the back of them both times. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what it feels like. If somebody hits you in the fucking back of the leg with the two by four, the first, and then the rehab, the rehab is miserable. And then shit, that's always in the back of your mind now. I bet, huh? No, not not as no. But I used to play a lot of golf, and about twelve holes in, it would start really hurting at first. The first year or two, that scar tissue, yeah. And then you get, yeah. it, it's just a miserable fucking deal. And I saw someone the other day tore their and playing football, and they're like, oh, they've got new surgeries now. It only takes three to four months to get over that bullshit on that. <laughs> There ain't no way. Yeah, well, it's, you know, they're trying to say that about Tommy John surgery yeah. and all those things. And, you know, modern modern medicine now, I mean, yeah, they can speed it up a little bit. But but your body, everybody's body is different on how it's going to take it, especially if it's a cadaver and they're putting that in there. You, I mean, who knows if the body's going to reject it or not. So, well, who was the one but kid? It, it, you know, NFL, NFL players are – different mindset they're they're those guys i mean the shit they do and how quick they come back from 
surgeries and injuries is amazing to me. As big and strong as those guys are, oh, my God. Well, there was one uh, NFL player, or not an NFL player, but I think he was a, a baseball pitcher, and his body did not take uh, the cadaver. Ended up getting like a nasty infection or something, or it tore yeah. apart or some shit. I can't remember who it was. Maybe Strasburg? Yeah. Yeah, it happens. I mean, people, it pro- probably staph infection or something. My daughter had a ACL surgery and was in the middle of a rehab three months in doing deep knee bends, range of motion, and it popped right in the middle of a rehab because it was a cadaver and it didn't take. And now she had to go all the way back through it again. So it's not something that's uh, a lot of fun. But you know what? That's the sacrifice of being an athlete. At the end of the day, you know, you're, you're leaving your body and body parts on the field. And, you know, the money's good. The camaraderie's good. I have no regrets. I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. The only problem is there's a lot of things nowadays I wish I could do, like run, that I can't do. It was just too hard on my body, and I just um, refuse to do it now. But it's worth it. How, how old are you, Jay? I am 56. How old's Ichiro? That's a good question. I think he's 45. I don't know, 44 or something it. like that. I don't know. You saw where he, he – he pinched hit in a in, in a in a inter squad yeah, game crazy. the other day, a couple three days ago. So, and the guy, I mean, I will tell you, the guy's insane shape. I mean, it's it's amazing. He can still fly. He's, I mean, he throws BP every day to him. Um, he still works with the outfielders and the base runners. Uh, the guy, excuse me, the guy can hit. He's a hitting machine. May not be the prettiest looking <laughs> swing in the world. It's almost like a. I got in trouble when I was broadcasting. I did some broadcasts for about six years with the Mariners, and I said, yeah, he's like a power slapper. Power slapper. They're like, <laughs> they're like power slapper. I'm, because I coached, you know, I coached my daughter in select softball for a lot of years and my and my boys in baseball. And uh, Somebody's at the door. Guard dog. Somebody knocked on the door. <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah. Whenever. So, in coaching quiet. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No big deal. Me, like, second, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go right. ahead. Go ahead. Ichiro is uh he's forty seven. I think he's playing with his son. I, I read a book about him a couple of years ago and he had a really horrible life growing up. Ichiro did? Yeah, and I I don't remember all the dynamics of it. I just remember it was but what a player. He's from uh Japan. Yeah. He Japan. played over there. He was a fast little bastard. Very fast. He was the base dealer. Yes. <clears throat> what a fucking lineup, though. They had a great team, but they come out of nowhere. They weren't real good, and all of a sudden they were excellent. Hey, in, 90, in 95? To my direct TV. Hey, Jay, <laughs> we're talking about your yeah. team. The 95 team was the first team that Seattle had that really come on the map. Am I right? Yeah, 95 was the team that basically we were like 16 games down going into August in – we just every day we won a game and every day that the team in front was the angels, they found a way to lose. And it was just like, next thing you know, we get into September and dude, I'm telling you, we're getting to the ballpark at one o'clock for a seven Oh five game. There's tailgating going on. <laughs> the places, the parking lots packed all September, 50,000 fans, every game. It was insane. You talking about having the 10th man on your side. That made a huge difference, huge difference. And then, you know, next thing you know, we win the whole thing and save baseball. Really and truly save baseball in the Northwest. Y'all, uh, without a doubt. Because we were going to Tampa Bay. That's right. We were going to Tampa Bay for sure. They were going to get an expansion team. We were, they were, there were flights that they were handing out a house and apartment locators and all sorts of stuff to us from Tampa, St. Pete. That's how, that's how for sure they thought we were. Going. Oh, I did not know that. And then, and then we got, we got on that run and that changed that shit real quick. Did, uh, real quick. I didn't know that they were going to change. I didn't know that they were going to move y'all. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, absolutely. Vince Coleman was on that team, right? Vince Coleman was on that team. Great man. That's a base yeah. stealer there. Now he had some wheels. Oh, dude. He was electric. I played with two of the most electric base stealers in the game, Vince Coleman and Ricky Ricky Henderson. Yep. Ricky, Hindu, Hindu, Ricky, 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 Ricky. Always talking to himself. <laughs> Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. Come on, Ricky. I remember the oh, first. What a, what a stud he was. He was chiseled. Chiseled. I rem- Push-ups, sit-ups, all he did, like Herschel Walker, uh-huh. and was absolutely, I think he had 3% body fat. It was insane. 
you, do you remember the game when Pudge Rodriguez come up as a rookie and Ricky Henderson tried to steal on him? And he, he <laughs> no, but I know Pudge. I know Pudge had a freaking. Hose. Oh, he threw him out by six feet, and and Henderson yeah, couldn't Pudge, believe it. Pudge had. He had a hose. What a what a great what a great arm he had. Now, He's, does the catcher talk any shit whenever you're in the where whenever you're in absolutely. the box? He does. Yeah, absolutely. If you're hitting, they'll be sitting there like this, and they'll be and they'll be looking up at you, making sure you're not getting you know the Google eye and trying to peek in and kind of see where he's setting mm-hmm. up and. Cause it's always a cat and mouse. You're trying to get the upper hand any way you can. And then they're doing all sorts of, you know, he's like, okay, here comes the slider just to mess with you. Or, Hey, what do you want right here? Uh, yeah, I mean, all the time they're, they're saying crap, but then a lot of times you just turn around and go, Hey, knock it off, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to hit could be in a jackass, but, but yeah, some guys, they want to talk to you. If, if you're good buddies with them, they'll try to distract you because you got, you know, no time at all to basically see the ball and hit. You got, I mean, your eyes can only basically grind for a certain amount of time from release point. And so you're trying to concentrate and be in the moment. And he's too busy. He's trying to distract you. If you can get one little thing to get your mind just out of it just for a split second, he's done his job. So that's what that's what they're paid to do. Who, it's part of the deal. Who's the worst one? But some of them that were like that, that were jackasses that wouldn't shut up and kept talking to you. There's always, you know, you don't get mad. The game, the game always policed itself back when I, you know, and, and – it doesn't do it anymore because now you can't take outside anybody at second or short. Can't bulldoze the catcher anymore. We just remember that there came a time and he was behind the plate. It was going to be a close play. He just ran his ass over at home plate. <laughs> who, who is? I mean, that that takes care of that crap real quick. Who is the worst one about talking shit in baseball? Oh, you know, most of the guys. I'll be honest with you. Most of the guys were pretty good. They didn't say a whole hell of a lot. I know. Um, what's this? Um, I'm drawing a blank. He's a catcher with um, with Chicago. Was what Carlton Fisk? Chicago. Carlton huh? Fisk? Not Fisk. It's a late. It later in my my era. Uh, he's now doing broadcast and stuff like that. I can't remember his name, but he would talk. He'd talk a lot of shit and wouldn't shut up. So. See, I think baseball needs this old school mentality. I mean, it needs the 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 running over the catcher, and it needs the physicality. In my mind. Yeah, A.J. Przinsky. That's who it okay. was. Okay, Przinsky. I remember him. Played for the Twins, yeah. too, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey, uh, exactly. Um, what do you think about the Houston Astros and all the shit, all that stuff? I, I think they made out like a bandit, man. I think the COVID saved their bacon. I think a lot of those guys would have had a complete meltdown. I mean, think, think about it. Like I was telling you about New York and, you know, Boston and how the fans are. They would have absolutely annihilated them. The fans would have, you know, they would have tried to put cops up there and say, hey, you can stop it. You can't yell at him. You can't scream at him. At some point when enough fans keep doing it and keep doing it, there's no way you can kick every fan out. There's no way when they drive into the players parking lot or go home at night or are on the road and all the things I was telling you about earlier. And they would have been fans would have absolutely ate them alive. And rightly so. They blatantly freaking cheated. Yeah, you admitted it. You cheated. That sucks, man. You don't, I mean, there's just certain things you don't do. And so I, it pisses me off as an ex-player because I wanted, I wanted the game to police itself and serve right justice. And that would have been the fans absolutely just lambasting them every time they came to the plate, no matter home or away, they would have, I mean, some of those guys would have broke down mentally. There's no way they could have handled it. But now COVID hits, they don't have to pay any consequences whatsoever. Most of the team's gone. They're at other places. And so they got away with basically freaking cheating. It pisses me off. And they almost they And I think you ask you ask any any player or an ex player, they'd say the same thing. I mean, you know, we all we all improvised. Mm-hmm. There was ways to basically get an upper hand. One thing you didn't do, you didn't run a private freaking cable line, private feeds, private TVs, all that stuff. But there were teams by I mean back forever there were there were hidden lights in, in ballparks that would light up for an off speed pitch. You know, there were things going on. You peek in. We used to relay signs from second base, first base to the hitter. You know, there's certain things that's 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 kind of the that's part of the game. Right. But when you start basically putting hidden cameras in, putting monitors in, and reading what the catcher signs are and picking it up, and you and you were warned once in seventeen, you were warned again, and you got away with it, you, you blatantly know you're doing wrong. 
That's bullshit. Best thing happened to baseball is they didn't win it again last year. Thank God. That would have been bad for baseball. Thank goodness. I mean, yeah, I'm, it'll – It'll be interesting, though. They're talented. There's no doubt about it. That's the thing. At the end of the day, they're so damn good. I don't see why they needed that. But um, it's like anything. You get so used to it and addicted to it, you got to know. I played with a lot of guys. We'd have the sign at second base. We're relaying to the hitter. Edgar Martinez, perfect example. He did not want to know. Do not relay to me. I don't want to know. I want to see the ball. I want to react. So there were guys that didn't want to do it because the one time you relay a sign and it's wrong – and you're counting on it, and all of a sudden you leave the bases loaded or you leave a guy on third base, and you don't get the job done because somebody relays the wrong sign, now you're pissed off. So there is a give and take. you gotta, you got to know that's part of the gamble. But so how, their gamble was totally different when you're beating on a freaking trash can. How do you, how do you, break, <laughs> how do you break down the sign enough to know? Because don't the catchers change that like in between every inning? They can, they can roll it over. You know, you just, you just, uh, it's just a progression deal. You go through checks. Some guys are really good at it. Got there's guys have books, other teams, a team in front of you. You got buddies on other, other teams that pick it up. They go through sequences, process of elimination for a sign after two, for a sign after four, last sign, first sign, whatever it may be touches. It could be, could be a bunch of different things. Um, now they've changed it up to the point now where they have the deal and it's damn near impossible to be able to pick it up. But um, now you try to get it out of the glove and rotation and stuff like that from grip and everything, especially if you're a base dealer. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you were hoping it was, it was a buddy system guys, advanced scouts, you know, are out there and all, you're always getting, you know, the day, uh, the, like that day you go to the ballpark early, there's a hitter's tape and a pitcher's tape and you go over hitters and hitters go over the pitcher and find out about tendencies and what they like to throw and what they like. And, you know, when they're ahead in the count, behind in the count, you know, all those different things, it's not a guarantee, but at least you know that in the back of your mind. And so it's just it's just one of those things you just continue to check off and hopefully you get it See, right. I think I would fuck that up. I would I would tell the poor guy in the batter's <clears throat> box, hey, you got a cur- you got an off but off speed kit pitch coming and it'd be a fucking fastball <laughs> high and he'd lean into that son of a bitch and get smoked. <laughs> What do you think? Well, and that's just it. You better be good at it because if you're not 100% sure, your teammate's going to freaking kill you. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be that. They're going to be like, dude, you just cost me some money right there because you told me a freaking fastball was coming and it was a change up and I looked like a complete jack wagon spun myself into the ground. <laughs> that would be me. But then, but then there's other guys that throw a nasty slider like Chapman did and all of a sudden Altuve takes him yaya in a hurry on the filthy pitch that there's no way in hell unless you know that's the pitch that that can happen. Same thing back when we played too, even though we knew if guy relayed a sign, a guy makes a nasty pitch and all of a sudden you come around and he's like, dude, they got my signs. They got my, there's no way they hit that unless they got my signs. So then they'll go like this, roll it over, roll it over. But you know, going back to what you guys talked about earlier about the game policing itself and all these things, the game's changed so damn much. Now they're trying to tell them how many pitching mound visits they can have and how many times the catcher can go out. Well, that's bullshit. If it's the middle of the playoffs and the game's on the line and you got a chance to win $350,000 for winning the World Series, that's extra money, extra fight money on top for winning. Every single player gets that. And they know they're picking up my signs. I screw you. I'm going to go out as much. I'm going to change it up as much as I want. I think that's wrong. Right. I think it's wrong. It's playoff baseball. Who cares how long the damn games go? People are going to tune in. Don't be telling pitchers, professional athlete, how many times they can make a mound visit. I think that's wrong. You're trying to speed the game up in places it ain't broke. It ain't doesn't need to be fixed. I saw. Stupid. I saw two things that changed baseball. I believe or that I've read about lately. First of all, and, and, I'll, and I'll give them to you, then you answer them. The first thing is is the replay, instant replay. Second thing is is that they're going to quit putting baseball on the radio, and I think baseball is a great radio sport. And f- TV ratings, um, I saw the 1976 World Series or something had 75 million people watch it. Last year's World Series had, I think, 18 or 23 million there's a huge right. there's the, the, baseball does not have the fanfare it used to have. Even when you play to today, it's not as popular as it was. What do you think the problem right. is? 
I, you know what? I think a lot of it is, you know, they're trying to fix what isn't broken. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's just they're trying to say that uh, the youth doesn't want sit around and watch, you know, three hour, three and a half hour games. And, I, you know, I don't know. I don't think we've done a very good job of, of promoting the game. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the commissioner and have to address that. But there's no doubt that uh, the game's the game's taking a, a beating right now, and we're going to have to do something to get people back in the stands. I think a lot of it too, man. I mean, it's expensive. Right, it is. I mean, go to go to go to a ball game. It is the one sport though that you're going to go to a ball game. At least you're going to get three hours of enjoyment, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but still, I mean, you know, you go and you park. It's twenty bucks. You get a ticket. You know, nosebleeds twenty bucks a pop. You know, you get a beer. It's fifteen dollars. You get. I mean, that that adds up in a hurry. So I think I think a lot of that is hurting it as well. Um. But you're right. Um, it uh, they need to do something. Is, the game the game has definitely changed in, in 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 a lot of different ways. Is the season too long? Do you think that could be? Do you think the it's requiring too much expen- attention I think, span? I, I think if you want to get you want to make the game fun and interesting and basically fresh and keep these guys fresh and doing crazy things and hitting balls out of the ballpark and having the best players on the field all the time. You need to cut 162 games in 185 days. Yeah. I mean, dude, that's a lot to ask on a body. Sure. That takes its toll. Especially, you know, at least now they've gotten rid of synthetic fields for the most part. Now they're all natural surfaces and stuff. Back in the old days, when you're playing on turf, I mean, it was like a piece of concrete and a piece of turf on top of the concrete. It was hardly any padding. The old football days and the old baseball, the, the, the basically double sports stadiums, Man, they they were brutal and diving and and just getting eaten up by the turf. So you take away some of those games, and I think it, I think it keeps the guys fresh, keeps the guys on the field, keeps the guys healthy, uh, gives the fans a chance to basically take a game off here or there and go, you know, do some family time, which doesn't hurt. Um, and then basically, you know, the next day the games start up again. I think 150 games is ample, quite frankly, but. Tell that to ownership group. You think they want to give up that money? Right. There's no way in hell they're going to give up right. that money. See, that's the thing, and I'm I'm not I'm not a huge baseball fan, but it, it just seems you get to like June, July, and August, and it's like Jesus Christ. And it's, dog, it's days. 110 dog days, dude, degrees. It's I don't want to go fucking sit in Ranger Stadium right now. So, yeah, it's a hot. Box. Yeah, now it's air conditioned. I think they had to start baseball season <laughs> the <laughs> week after fucking football season, in that downtime. And play it and be done before football starts in September. Yeah, I like fall they're, baseball. They're up though. against they're up against football. And the second thing I would do, I would sell everybody on the fact if you're a single guy, go to Arlington Stadium. There's more eye candy running around there than anywhere in the world. The best looking women in the world are the Texas Rangers game running around. And they've done a great job with that stadium. Talking about that, more and more of these stadiums have retractable roofs. They're closing them in. They should have done that in Arlington forever because it is so damn hot. That zaps that team. Yeah. A lot of times you go in there in, in July and August, especially August, September, they won't, they don't, they might only hit the first day and they don't take BP. Well, fans like to come to watch batting practice and see the superstars hit and all that. Half the time they not, might not be taking BP or a certain guy is taking the day off because it's too damn hot. So I agree with you. You get it in where it's air conditioned and all that thing. Texas, man, it, yeah, them girls running around in cowboy <laughs> boots. Woo, I agree with you. Um, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it does. It takes a grind on you, especially for us, too. We're, we were used to being in a dome stadium. Now we come to Arlington, we melt yeah. it. I mean, we were great the first game, but then the second game, it's like, Err. and then the third day, it's like we're running in quicksand. I mean, it just zaps your butt. Um, but it also it also costs them down the stretch. I, I agree with you. I like I like playoff baseball. I like it when it, the temperature drops and it yeah. gets cold. I don't like it going into November because now it's if, – if you are going to do that, then it needs to be like what, what we did this year and have it in a neutral ballpark where it's at least domed and closed in and you've guaranteed to get the games in. You don't have to worry about getting rained out or snowed out or whatever that means. Where did they play the World Series? Was it in Arlington this year? 
Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, it was. It and, and they they sold tickets, which was killer. I mean, it was the first time they'd actually what they sell ten thousand tickets. I think they're in the have to look it up. They're in the uh, championship round, think, and then uh, yeah, that was pretty cool to actually see fans. So, do you think base? And I think in that where they're doing, aren't they doing everything with the uh, with the girls uh, basketball playoffs? I think everything is up there, but doing it hosted in Texas because. Yeah. Obviously, Texas just passed what they did, and and Texas is Texas, and uh, and so they're taking advantage the right. of that, which I think is great because now players. Let's face it, you guys. I mean, if you're an athlete, you want to play in front of fans. You feed off those right. people. You want some accountability. Um, you want that. that it, it just gets that your hair going, the, the standing up on your head. The extra juice is flowing. You know, I mean, there's nothing like a, playing in front of a fold out uh, fold. A full house. Sorry, spit that out three <laughs> times, and and being able to feed off those people, and I mean that tenth man, it was huge. I mean, home field advantage comes into play. I love that. That's I think that was talking to guys. The one thing they said that killed them this this past year was not having fans. They they're like it was brutal. We got these cutouts. They're playing all. They're piping in all this BS stuff in there to make it feel like there's people and crowd noise and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden somebody's making a great play and they're and you got somebody on the other team going. <laughs> they're getting a little courtesy golf clap. You know, it's like woo. That would this, suck. Uh, that would this suck. year will be a telling deal because, like Texas, you come play Houston or Texas, you're going to play in full stadiums. They're going to have 100 percent crowds and stuff. Yeah. And then you go, you're going to yeah. go play in some liberal place like Seattle. They might not even have anybody at a game. You know, Chicago, New York, you know, I mean, Boston, New York, you don't Boston. Know. I mean, they may not have a person in this and it's going to make a big difference if they play 162 games or whatever they play with that kind of crowd. I agree. I agree. And that's a shame, too, because that New York's new stadium, all those new stadiums, they're so awesome. They're such an attraction. I mean, you know, you get you get the fans that go down there and they make a day of it and they tailgate and you walk up and down like a lot of those ballparks like to do. New Texas ballpark, you know, they got all the bars and restaurants right there. You never have to leave. You just do everything there. You, you can stay in the hotel right there at the ballpark. I mean, it's like turnkey as best you can have it. It's nirvana for a baseball fan or a sports fan. And then same thing, New York and all that. I mean, it take you – you got to go three days in a row at the new Yankee Stadium just to eat at all the, the different restaurants they have. And, I mean, it's phenomenal. So some of these ballparks – I mean, half the time, the fans, you know, they're going because it's an attraction in itself, let alone now the bonus is you get to watch the game a little bit. So um, I hope that these fans get a chance, and, and even if it's small amounts and, and we slowly kind of ramp it up. Seattle, perfect example. They just 25% for restaurants. They just opened that up two weeks ago. Jeez, we were that a year ago. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, it's rough for those, you know, a lot of my buddies in the restaurant business are freaking dying, man. It, small business owners, it's it just sucks. And yeah, you can't make a profit. You them. can't make money no, at all. You can't even pay your fucking staff at 25%, no. let alone food costs no, and beer. No, and, and they're trying to do everything they can to kind of keep things going and, and pay these people and, and sell off some of their wine at cost just yeah. to kind of, so they can pay the bills. I mean, just... You know, it's going on everywhere across this great country, and it's it, it's a shame. Is it a train? Well, Jay, we would like to have uh, you come hold on. Go ahead. Go hold ahead. on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I save the the toughest topic for last. Yeah, hang on, pops. Wait, Wait a <laughs> second. God damn, just slow down. Um, steroids. How does that affect somebody hitting a baseball? You got a little ball and a little bat. Is it is it you just the power? You guys, yeah. You still got to see it. That's what I'm saying. At the end of the day, trying to get a round ball with a round bat, and and you still got to square it up. Um, At the end of the day, I mean, the freaking numbers that Barry Bonds put up, I mean, I don't even think he can do it on Nintendo or, you know, any of that stuff. I mean, it was crazy the year he had when he hit, what did he hit, 78? 74. 78 or something crazy. He walked 100, like 200 times. So when he didn't walk, he hit a damn home run. You still got to square it up and put it in play. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, was it a problem? Yeah, it was a problem in the game. And it was and it was good for the game to get it to get it out. Um, but, you know, I, I still think uh, guys like that should still be in the hall. I was going to ask you. I think the number the number the numbers they put up were insane. Ro- Roger Clemens, he needs to be in the Hall of Fame. I think I love Roger Clemens. So I'm a fan of Roger Clemens. Kurt Schilling. 
Grew up in Houston. Big fan. Um, Kurt Schilling, great pitcher. Kurt Schilling just he's get his mouse getting him in trouble. But, yeah. That's the problem. That has nothing to do with baseball, though. I, well, that it does to to a lot of the tr- traditional voters. They take all that into account, man. I mean, some of the people that have the right to vote, you know, are not are looking. There's, there's more to it than just the numbers that are on the paper. I think personally, I think they, I think some of them are, some of them hold some of those guys. I mean, how's King Griffey Jr. not a unanimous choice getting in the Hall of Fame? Oh, that's true too. I mean, seriously. So it makes you just scratch your head, going, "Who the hell didn't vote for him, and who got butt hurt?" You know what? He didn't. He didn't. Somebody didn't give him an interview, or somebody yelled at you and said it was a stupid question. And then you know, it's just all. I mean, what well, it's at the end of the day, the numbers should speak. It, for It's kind of like the uh, if we took if we took into account all the old timers, Babe Ruth wouldn't get in for all his off field antics if he was alive today. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is so, true. <laughs> you ought to be done what you do between the lines. The man liked his golden shower. That That's is right. Sure. He yeah. liked his what? Golden Wait a shower. second. I've not heard this. <laughs> Babe Ruth liked to get pissed on. <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> Jay. Look it up. Do some, do some research. Jay, do don't, some research don't leave me hanging on this. Babe Ruth liked to get pissed on. What in the world? Joe DiMaggio, yeah. he's married to what, uh, Monroe? Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Those, those bit. Yeah. He liked his Indian motorcycle, and I think he liked he, he liked his uh, libations, and he liked his women. Jeez. I tell you what. I mean, what a long season. I mean, there's there's got to be looks. If you want to get pissed on, it's a long season. Go ahead and get pissed on. I guess I don't know. Kudos to Babe. Kudos yeah, that to happens. In, that happens in the shower from time to time. I couldn't do that. That was that. That's. Yeah, I mean, there, so there, there's some crazy stuff that happens throughout the course of the year, dude. You, it gets monotonous. It's like Groundhog's Day. You gotta have some practical jokers and guys that keep things things loose and honest. You gotta have a coaching staff that knows how to kick you in the butt and how to stroke you. Some guys being able to read basically personalities. You got to have guys, you know, you, some guys, you got to stroke. Mm-hmm. Some guys, you got to kick them in the ass. Some guys shut down if you kick them in the ass. Some guys don't want to be stroked, you know. I mean, it's there's so many different nationalities. There's so many different personalities. There's so many things that come into, a, into account when you play throughout the course of a long season. You got to keep it fun. You got to keep it honest. That's what's great about kangaroo court. That's what's great about uh, every time on the road, first night, meet in the lobby in 30 minutes. We're all going to dinner. You go to dinner as a team. You know, you just uh, you do early BP, come to early BP. Guys come out. Pitchers come to early P- BP and shag at the end of the day. I'm buying lunch. Bring in lunch. Everybody sits around. I mean, j- these are those, you know, those moments that you basically, that's how you become tight-knit as a, as a baseball club. And, um you know, it does. 162 games in 185 days, not including the playoffs, not including two months in spring, spring training. training. Dude, it's a grind. It is a grind. And that's where right here, you got to be strong. And after a while, after a certain amount of time, the old ticker brain gets it gets tired and it's time to time to walk away. Safe face. So now do you have to take a shower in front of these other guys? <laughs> I've got a little penis, so what's I would not want to do this. Take, what's wrong with taking a shower in front Look, of Look, I got a little I got a little automatic. It's not a big deal. I've got a little pecker, so they're gonna make fun of me. So what? Get over no. it. Pull on it a pull on it a little <laughs> bit and get it hard. Walk in there with the hard on <laughs> That'd be even it. worse. I mean, you know, walk in with walk in with a face cloth on it, let it hang there and go, hey, anybody need a face cloth? <laughs> I mean, little things, I mean, you, you gotta do you got to do what you got to do, uh, you know. I mean, I was notorious for doing certain things. We, whenever it was our last game on the road, I'd always go around to all the shampoo bottles. And I'd take all the lids off because they put them on the floor all the way around. Uh-huh. And I'd go around. Norm would start on one side. I'd start on the other side. And uh, we'd take all the lids off on the shampoo and conditioner. And he'd start on one end, and we'd meet in the middle. We'd drink about four or five beers and then uh-huh. save it up and then piss in all the freaking uh-huh. shampoo and conditioner uh-huh. bottles. Put the lids back on it, and whoever was following us, usually it was Oakland or Anaheim, uh, were following us and coming in behind us, and they just got a little extra something-something in their shampoo bottle. <laughs> it's good for your hair. It makes it shine, I think. <laughs> I mean, it really does. Yeah, they caught on to it, and the payback was hell on all the guys. Being a bald-headed dude, I didn't ever have to worry about shampooing my hair or conditioning. 
somebody put Flexol in the conditioner and our guys came out of the shower hot <laughs> in more ways than one. Hot because their head was on fire and hot at me because they knew I was the one that was responsible for it. <laughs> <laughs> did not stop. Did not stop me. I just said, here, guys, I'll make sure. Here, Here's a shampoo bottle and here's a conditioner bottle. And they just knew to use that one, not the ones that were in the shower. Your wife must have been like, oh, good. I get to put up with all these antics now that he's retired every day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I tell you, behind every every man is a great woman. My wife is a godsend and the rock and foundation raised our three kids, which are the greatest kids in the world. And if it wasn't for her, I'd be in jail or maybe dead. Um, <laughs> so to put up with me, to put up with my schedule for a professional athlete, I was the first one there, last one to yeah. leave, you know, and they had to send the kids in to get me, tell your dad to hurry up. Cause you know, I just, it's just how it was. I mean, long nights, long years. And, and she handled it like a trooper, man. So she is the unsung hero behind it all. I mean, all the accolades and all the things that I got throughout my career wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for her. Now to and I think that, that doesn't happen very often in sports anymore. I mean, you know, I mean, we've been married 33 years. She's my high school sweetheart. And basically I was blessed, yeah. you know, to run into her and meet her and make her my wife. So. Towards the end, was she having a conversation with you also like, hey, Jay, maybe it's time that we think about you retiring? Or was it totally up to you? Um, no, she never. That never once. She never once said that. She she was concerned because every off season I was getting a major surgery. Every off season I was beat up, and I, they had a, a human a human anatomy chart in the training room that our head trainer Rick Griffin basically would hang up, and it had a piece of dental floss and a pen, <laughs> and it had over the years all in it showed every single surgery ailment, whatever I did wrong on this human anatomy chart. He would leave it in there because they would, during the off season, that's what they do at ballparks. They bring in groups and people can come in and walk them around and all that stuff or before, you know, early before the games or when we're on the road. So it, it got basically became pretty famous, this anatomy chart over the years. And after a while, that's, that's what ended up being the final verdict for me is I knew it was time to say when. Yeah. But no, she never, she, she fully supported everything I did and she wanted to get back to Texas, um, which was a little bit harder because we had our kids in school and you got to make a decision on where you're going to have your kids grow up. But well, Jay, now we're back. We're baby. glad you're back in Texas. We would love to have you up here bless Texas, at the big honker baby. lodge. If you can ever swing it and get up here. Uh, we'd hey, love let's, let, that's one thing I want to do. Let's go whack them and stack them one of these days. Uh, let's make a point to go uh, pull a trigger here or there and tip a beer and uh, shoot the cut and tell some war stories. Because uh, you guys, I mean, for all us athletes, ex-athletes out there, I mean, we live and breathe hunting and fishing. That's what it's all about. And So uh, I want to put you guys, uh, it'd be my honor to be able to go out and pull a trigger with you guys. So we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Anytime. You're more than welcome up here. Hey, Jay, thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless your family, and we look forward to having you up here with us. Welcome to Texas. God is great, and God bless you guys, and I enjoyed it, and uh, my best to you guys. All right, stay safe out there. It's a crazy world. Yes, crazy world, man. Watch out for that damn cancel culture. <laughs> they want to they wanna, they wanna get you. I think we tiptoed around everything today, so I, think, I don't think we're getting canceled for <laughs> another think, day. I think we did. At least I tried to think before I spunk. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Well, y'all, ha y'all have a great night, and uh, it was a pleasure. Good to good to sh shoot. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, Mr. Jay Buner. The he, one and only. That was he, a lot of fun. He was a <laughs> stud. Yeah, he was. It was a hell of a baseball team he was on. Yeah, hell of a baseball team. I mean, yeah. You talk about Ichiro. I mean, you just you just ran through. Well, well, Ichiro played later well, on. Well, later on, on but I mean, the 95, was it, was, loaded. it was loaded. Yep, a lot of great. Ken Griffey of, Jr., you got Randy Johnson as a pitcher. Yep. A lot Jay of, Buhner. A lot of great players. That was a very interesting time in our in, in, for baseball back I think then. it was when baseball was at its height. No, that would have been the 70s. You don't think so? No, nah, baseball, baseball in the 70s was huge. Now, it was good 90s, don't get me wrong. It was still more popular. <laughs> Maybe that's just It was because. before we got the fucking iPhones. <laughs> right. I think it, that's when I watched baseball was in the mid nineties. Yeah, and I, I remember Mark McGuire breaking the home run record, and you know uh, Sosa the same year, Barry Bonds. Yeah, mid nineties was when baseball know. baseball was really big then. Right, but it's right in in the seventies. It had a romantic type deal with the country, and 
I really, I did. I saw, I read the other day that somebody was not going to have radio. They wouldn't have baseball on the radio one team this year. They were just going to stream it somewhere on a live streaming device. Right. You're going to lose your old timer that gets in the truck, listens to AM radio or whatever. That's what Ron would do. Yeah. He would He would drive down the road and listen to baseball. 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 He didn't give a shit who was playing. He baseball would just he is a, to listen to baseball. Baseball is a good radio sport. <laughs> yeah. The best radio sport there is because you can see it all. You can, you know, the it's, right. football, it's hard to believe. You know, they're like, you know, well, they talk so fucking he, fast. He breaks around the end. He's cut left, cut right, cut right. He lost three yards on the play. You're right. like, well, fuck, it sounded like he had a 15-yard gain. So yeah. you, you can't ever tell. But anyways, Jay's a great guy. Look forward to having you come on a hunt with us. It was a very, very good podcast. Who is he kin to? Hmm? Who's he kin to that's in our podcast page? I don't I don't know what you're talking about. Who's he friends with? That Trevor Austin. Okay, that that's he knows Trevor and them. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Trevor set this all up for us there, Jeffrey. Okay. Well, you should have told me that before I said I it. I did right? tell you well, this. You t- I Andy, told you this weeks ago. Andy, I've got a lot of stuff on my plate. Mm-hmm. I have a full busy. I'm not like you and Tony. Yeah. Y'all are world travelers. Fixing to go skiing. Yep. Yep. Looking yep. forward to it. Yep. Leaving me here by myself. Family trip. Me and Michelle didn't even get invited. <coughs> Going down the mountains. I, You know, uh, I talked to Kaufman yesterday. He said they're supposed to have 60 inches of snow. Yeah. Denver's supposed to get rocked by it. Winter storm. How much are y'all supposed to have in New Mexico? Oh, I don't know. I hadn't looked. It's supposed to snow. So we leave Saturday. It's supposed to snow Saturday night. I wish y'all fresh get, pow. Jeff. I wish y'all fresh get about pow. two or twenty four or about two foot of fresh pow, and you come back and tell me how fun it is to ski on fresh pow. <clears throat> Probably not very fun. Groomed place is a lot easier for someone who's not a very good is. skier. Not a very good skier. Yeah, you're not a good skier. You're 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 you're, you're, you're a decent skier for an amateur. You're not a good skier. I'm a good skier. No, you're not. You can't go down moguls and blacks and doing all that shit. I can go down blacks. No, going around the edges of them is not counting. I'm talking about going, going down, down them, going over the fucking moguls and shit. No. Yeah. I've seen you ski Jeff. before, Andy. Jeff. No, you hadn't seen me ski since I've gotten so good. You saw me ski when I was an awkward teenager. That's the last teenager. time you went. You didn't fucking ski but half a day. I saw you ski and I thought, hmm, that motherfucker's not Olympic material by any not, means. Well, fuck, no, I'm not Olympic That's material. That's what I'm saying. You're just I never aver- said I was Olympic material, but I can go down fucking you're, blacks. You're an average skier at best. Above at average. Best. No, you're not. If average is a 50, I'm a solid 57 let, and a half. Let me tell you something. I was at Crested Butte skiing one time. Here and, he goes, name and, dropping. And I'm cutting, that, that's where I was at. Okay. I'm not dropping no names. I was okay. at Crested Butte. And I come down this this little trail between one spot to another, and my jacket that I had was a lot like the ones that the ski patrol had. Mm-hmm. And this lady is like, "Sir, do you mind if I get my ski right there?" I'm like, "No, I don't mind at all. You know, well, why the fuck do I care?" And it's kind of up in a tree almost. I'm like, "How the fuck did you get your ski up there?" She goes, "I'm probably not as good a skier as you are." I go, "You obviously aren't." And she put that motherfucker on, and she went down. Where we were going across, she was going down. Like a ungroomed fucking trees and shit. I thought, no, lady, you're a whole lot better skier than I would ever even think about doing. That's a skier. You're not a skier. <laughs> I never you're said. You're just a once a year weekend. Yes, that's all okay. that I am. Well, you but I'm better than how, average. How do you know? Because I can do any any run that's on the mountain. I can do comfortably. <laughs> I can. <laughs> you better go somewhere at else to two, ski besides Red River then, the, if you think at, that. At Angel Fire, I can do the whole mountain. <laughs> Uh, you want to get humbled real quick? Go over to Taos, about 35 miles That's, away, and ski there okay. one time. But what I'm saying is is that everywhere I've gone, there wasn't a run on there that I didn't feel comfortable going down. That's all that I've said, and I've only skied at Angel Fire. Mm. I've mastered Angel Fire. Mastered, huh? <laughs> you are absolutely fucking clueless. <laughs> Go to Taos and ski and just ski the blues and see how you think. Maybe one day I will, Jeff. <laughs> Their blues are like double black diamonds okay. in Red River. Well, when my kids get a little bit older. Ski King. We got it. Okay. Andy's going to be trying out on the 2022 West Texas Olympic team. Would you I say would. you're the best skier in Knox City? Yes, 100%. <laughs> Who's better than me? I don't fucking clue. There's, other, there's some other chodge in town that can ski down everything. No, there's not. Yeah, there is. No, there's not. I don't <laughs> know of anybody in Knox City that skis. Uh, Scott Lennon, them just got back from skiing. I'd run circles. How do you know? I would fucking tuck my old legs and I'd like a rocket. That's how you do it, Jeff. I've been working out. I'm ready for this. Mm. We got to go. Get the fuck off of here. Bye, y'all. <laughs> do we have another one today? Yeah, buddy. 
All right, and go check out all of our sponsors. You know the ones. Go check out Foul Bandit, Stanfield Hunting Outfitter, Gundog Outdoors, Dirty Duck Coffee, Dive Bomb Industries, Boss Shot Shells, Pacific Calls. Thank you, boys, for setting this fun podcast up. We had a really good time with Jay. Lucky Duck, Looking Glass Duck Club, never forget. William Chris Wines, Blind Grass, and 14 Cattle Crows.